and Ain't No Face is a synth punk artist who grew up in Tucson, Arizona. And before we get into it, please be sure to check out the other entries in our Story Up series and comment below what you want us to do next. From a young age, Nate had a variety of interests and has early memories of asking his mother to purchase him albums. One of the earliest to come to his memory was Buddy Holly, which would evolve into more hip-hop-based music and then bands like Suicidal Tendencies. As a kid, he would get heavily into comics and even draw a couple comic books on his own, one of which was the story of two rats fighting, which he was reluctant to show anybody, which is a common theme in Nate's story. But despite Nate's artistic and musical interests, it was impossible to escape what was around him as a child. Everyone around Nate wanted to be a narco, and these guys were the ones with the money and status in his community. Nate himself stayed out of this, and although he avoided selling, he couldn't escape the allure of using it as he would start smoking weed at a young age. It was exposed to cocaine amongst his family members. Around 14 to 15 years old, he would get more into the use of cocaine, and one of his friends would go as far as to frequently steal it from his sister. Nate never saw drug use as a negative thing, as everyone he was around would do drugs and had status in the world that he was born in. What had initially gotten you to try drugs for the first time? It was or to take, just, or to take an up a notch. Because, you know, yeah, yeah, people, no, do smoke, uh, people smoke weed, but, like, there's a... Yeah, yeah, there's I think another... I smoke... Yeah, I smoke weed hanging out with my skater friends, but uh, Coke was just... I watched my uncles do it, and, like I said, tons of people I know did it, had a handle on it. I, yeah. I didn't know no fucking Cokeheads, or... I mean, maybe they're, you know... But no, you know, motherfuckers pawning shit, or my people were selling it, and there was so much of it, you were doing it. And then my buddy started stealing shit, stealing it from his sister when we were, like... 15 14 like maybe 15 she had so much of it she one day gave him his safe combination and uh to grab something out of it and he remembered it so he would always mm -hmm. go in her safe and steal coke she had so much of it she wouldn't even realize the shit's missing and he would take it and we would just fucking hang out and be like hey let's try this fuck it and we're 15 year old kids it was just you know we're in the desert the fucking nothing to do it's just this is before internet shit, you know? Yeah. So it's just boredom, man. And, and like I said, watching your peers do it, I never saw it hurt nobody. So it never made me go, oh, if I do this, I'm gonna get fucked up. The dudes I saw doing it again were big trucks, money, gold chains. I mean, they were, you know, they were handling it. Nate's brother was big into hustling and the lifestyle that Nate avoided would take four years off his brother's life that he would serve in prison. Despite the world around him, Nate maintained an interest in music. He would often pick up various music magazines and dive in, consuming as much information as he could. At the young age of 18, he bought an SP-1200 at the back of a source magazine. Nate would begin making music in secret for years, as no one around him had any interest in what he was doing and didn't understand at all what he was doing and would clown him for it. Nate went to high school in Tucson, where one of his teachers would bring her 10-year-old son into class often. And after high school, the people who would clown him for making music would push him to pursue an education in audio engineering at the conservatory in Phoenix, Arizona. He would add a Casio keyboard to his arsenal to match his sampler, and it was from here that he would meet like-minded people and expand on his musical interests. After Nate's brother did his time, he was released when Nate was 21, and would go on to open a record store called Planet Z, but unfortunately couldn't maintain the business. Nate would later go on to open his own record store called All City Records. All City focused on hip hop culture. And although the store was only open for a brief period, it was this period where Nate No Face would take shape. Nate would expand further on his music taste as a local graffiti artist would stop in and put him on to various punk bands. These interactions would completely change Nate's approach to making music. And after the store was closed, he would try to emulate that style on synths and samplers. That same 10 year old kid, his teacher would bring to class named Tommy, would come into the store, much older now, he would develop a relationship with Nate. The two would start a duo called I Was a Teenage Monster and begin doing remixes. But with Nate getting older and still not showing or promoting his music to anybody, what would change? The internet will allow you to find a small group even only that will fuck with you, you know what I mean? So you can find and get a cult following off the internet and maybe enough to where you can 
fucking flourish and fucking make money off of it. You know, I find uh, abstract artists on the internet that I'll tell my homies about and they'll be like, I have no idea who that person is. Yet I know that person is making a living off of their art. So that tells me that person isn't big enough to where the world knows about them, but they found a following enough to sustain their living off of art. Maybe they're not buying chains and cars off their music, but they're paying their rent. They're feeding themselves, you know? And I think people need to really get on the level of that is your music doesn't need to be don't think it's if just because you didn't make it enough to buy the Bentley that it's bad if you're feeding yourself off of it at least then you're doing it man you're a working artist you know what I mean I ain't paid off my shit I'm just barely scraping by but I'm happier you know yeah. than wrenches on planes so the industry just made it to where indie artists can really eat better than, than, than back then in the day when you had to hit it you know what I mean I'm reluctant to share his music with the world his brother would steal Nate's music and upload it to MySpace claiming ownership simply because Nate didn't want his face attached to it with nobody knowing it was him this is where Nate No Face originated from shortly after opening Nate would start bringing his equipment to the store and record local kids for $20 an hour sending them home with the cassette yeah, I was like, let me set up a uh, little studio in my store and computer recording, home recording wasn't big at that time. So I would record kids 20 bucks an hour. You leave with a burned CD on my beat. So they would grab instrumentals from records in my store and just rap. Well, when I would shut the store down, I would try to sing on the most insane beats, like reverse guitars, reverse drums, sing in falsetto notes, do the most weird shit, man. Like it all in hiding, not show nobody. And then MySpace came around and I threw it on MySpace and it started to get a buzz in my city. No one knew it was the guy who owned the hip hop store. I hid my name, I hid, and that's how Nate No Face came about. Cause I, people would even DM me, who is this? Who is this? I want to book you. And then right around that time, my buddy saw me doing that music and we heard Crystal Castles. Unfortunately, All City wouldn't last very long and it was closed a year and a half after opening. But his brother would later open a record store called Rosie's, named after their mom, in the same location. Tommy would approach Nate one day with the idea to make punk music on Game Boys. Local DJ, Cutma, would hear Crime Kills and began sharing the music, and they would start to develop a local following with their band in the early 2010s, even getting attention from some local news stations and signing to a local label. They released multiple projects, including Kills Kids in 2010, Destroy Stress and the Slauson EP in 2013, as well as a handful of singles. We're gonna buy Game Boys and make the music directly on Game Boys, That's no stamp. How did so, you how did you do that? How did you It's a literally a style of music called chip tune where you yeah. get it so my boy did chip tune. I mean he didn't do it, but he was like, yo, we're gonna do the same thing chip tune artists do, but they're making like they're remaking Zelda or they're making beats. Like they were just doing weird, like kind of hip hop or just weird electro shit. My boy was like, We're gonna make punk. Just a, a one, two, doom chi doom chi, and he's gonna do bass line and that's it. And I'm gonna scream on it. And uh uh so that's you know we did that and uh, uh you know we took off we kind of we could book some songs into workaholics la started noticing us we'd come out here and do shows and then we were fuck ups and so that band disbanded and i was like i'm gonna still scream man and started doing it on my own so that's the long story to uh, uh how it went from hip-hop beats to weirdo singing music that's fire crime kills we'll build a call following in tucson and begin booking shows Beyond the local success, they would even get a placement on the TV show Workaholics in the 2012 episode, Real Time. After Crime Kills ended, Nate still felt the urge to make music. He would eventually make his way to South Central LA and then Long Beach, where he would get a job at the local airport. He lived there for eight years in a studio apartment with his girlfriend, who was doing photography at the time. He would record in his closet enough to get noise complaints through the loud music and singing as the neighbors who weren't a huge fan of his style. After the move further west, Nate's music would start to pick up. He would land a huge opportunity opening for City Morgue on their sold out tour, exposing him to a huge fan base, and then would end up on tour with Horror, where he would try singing for the first time at the LA stop 
Over the past couple of years, Nate has focused on sobriety and staying healthy. Now being able to support himself off his music, he lives a little bit more comfortably. In 2022, he released Homicide and Collusion, both getting great reception from his fans. One thing is for sure, the story of Nate No Face is not finished yet. But you can be sure that as the story continues, we'll have the update. I'm Dammit Bobby, and on behalf of Call Classic, this has been the story of Nate No Face.